Good day, everyone, and welcome to Dico Grande, your home for big, fat, juicy 3D tutorials and walkthroughs. This video here is a supplementary video from the projection mapping tutorial I have in my main channel, and in it, it features this spaceship, and I wanted to go through it in some general terms about how I went about modeling it, my thought processes, all that sort of stuff. This is going to be more of a time-lapse video, so it will cover the basic modeling techniques I went through, all that sort of stuff. And as we jump into this video and you look at this thing and say, I want to download this uh, whole model, feel free to sign up to my Patreon, three bucks a month, you get access to the models, you get access to these videos, you get access to everything I also have produced in the past, uh, all access basically, and you have access to the Discord channel so you can ask questions. So if you're interested in that, feel free to sign up. If you just enjoyed this video, please give a like, subscribe, all that sort of stuff, and we can jump right in. So straight off the bat, uh, I just want to say, um, it's always a good idea to have some sort of sketch in mind. So as you can see in the video there, uh, we have a sketch. It's so much harder to get things done when you're just walking around or modeling around aimlessly inside of Blender or any other 3D software. So it's really important to at least have some sort of idea about what you want to make. Unless you're going down the full on kit bashing route where you just want to put a bunch of shit together and see what happens. That's fine too, but um, if you want to go for a more designed approach, it's always a good idea to have some sort of sketch. Even if it's just a really crappy napkin sketch, sketch it's fine. It doesn't really matter what you have, um, as long as you're creating it from some sort of plan. Way, way easier. Another thing to be aware of with these videos that I'm going to be publishing here on Dico Grande is that I may be using things that aren't part of the vanilla set of Blender. So whether it's plugins or tools or things I download uh, to be used in Blender, uh, I'm not going to be using 100% vanilla here. So part of the reason for that is because I am modeling these things for myself. I'm not really modeling them for anyone like an audience or anything like that. These are just really meant to be supplementary videos. The other thing as well is um, when you are producing stuff as a professional 3D artist like I am, you need to find tools that make life easier. So I'm actually trying to find things that make my life easier as a modeler. Um, in this case, I'm using the box cutter plugin, so to speak, uh, for this video. Um, I don't use it very well because I'm still learning how to use it. Um, and I do give up using it eventually because there are some things you need to, need to be aware of is that when you are working to your own deadline or to someone else's deadline, um, there is opportunity to try new tools, but if they do start to slow you down beyond the benefit of having them, at least initially, then it's better to fall back to what you know and just work with things that perform better. Um, I'm sure that in the future, as I get more used to using these plugins, that um, I'll probably get, become more proficient in how to use them. That being said, when I was using the box cutter tool set, it was really nice to allow me to block things out fairly quickly. And again, if I want to get into the more in-depth tutorials on how to use that, I'll have to learn them myself. So um, maybe one day I'll cover it in the future. But uh, again, it's really up to you whether or not you use it or not. It doesn't really make much difference when it comes to this early stage of blocking. So yeah, let's talk about uh, what my thought process was when building out this ship. So initially, it was always going to start off with those initial primary shapes. So you should always work your way from the big, chunky bits down to the secondary bits down to the tertiary bits and as I model through this you'll see that I sort of whittle my way down um, some things I model myself other things I use uh, from a asset library particularly the tertiary elements so anything that is um, you know like the engine parts vents that sort of stuff I jump into using the um, the asset manager in Blender. So I've downloaded a bunch of shit from um, ArtStation, asset packs and stuff like that, and just use those for the engines. Because if you are capable of being able to model things fairly well, and you understand how certain things work, you get to a point where you just gotta say, yeah, I could model this, but what's the point? Someone else has already done the job <laughs> and um, my work probably won't look any much different or better than whatever I can download from online. So let's just use that. Um, if you are practicing, of course, and you want to get better at doing those sort of things and building up your own asset library that is more unique to whatever you're building, 
then it's definitely worth going through and doing everything yourself. But again, if you really don't have the time or you just really are just trying to develop a idea or a concept, you shouldn't really be bothering. Um, you should just be finding the best asset packs you can find and working with those, particularly with hard surface, because with hard surface, you know, event is event or uh, an engine part is an engine part. Um, unless you're going with something that is super sci-fi or really organic or really unique to your design, again, there's not much use in going through all that pain of having to model everything from scratch. Um, it's also a trap for many newbie modelers and artists who think that it is cheating, and it really isn't in this case, um, especially if you're just trying to build something for yourself. The other thing I want to talk about is establishing some rules for yourself. So what are the things that you want to get out of the model? So when is, how's it going to be used? Is it going to be animated? And uh, if it is going to be animated, how will it be animated? So in this case, I wanted to establish a few rules for myself. One, I did not want to rely on any, de, um, any subdivision surfaces or displacements. I didn't want to do any of that shit. Um, because if you do want to have any kind of displacements, uh, you'd need to have a decently quadded up subdivided, subdivided structure. That is just too much work for something that won't be on the screen for very long and is also too much work for something that um, isn't going to be that close to the camera to begin with. So worrying about good inverted commas topology don't care. Don't care in this case. It's a waste of time. So that means I can be a lot more free with just triangles everywhere, end gons, you name it. Uh, cutting out things, uh, you know, boolean things. As you can see here with the windows, pretty much just boolean them out, cut through the mesh, and add some solidity through the inside of the um, the cockpit. Um, the other thing to be aware of as well is knowing on whether or not your ship or your vehicle is going to be featured in different kinds of shots. So are you going to be showing any interiors or whatever? Um, if that's the case, you may want to include that into your model. Or if your interior shot in an animation is going to be completely interior and you're not going to feature your character going from inside to outside the ship, then you can probably get away with just having two separate models for two different sets and two different situations. You don't have to have a jack of all trades model that can be featured in every single shot. So in this case, I'm not gonna bother with the interior. There's no point because at least in the animation that I featured in the um, the previous video, why would I model it in there if it's not gonna be shown? So keep that in mind. Now, because I am not gonna be relying on any subdivision services, uh, smoothing or anything like that, uh, it's important that when I do model this thing that I am modeling with some degree of decent poly count, if that makes sense. So if I'm going to bevel something and I want it to be kind of smooth, <laughs> you need to actually make sure that it's in the model because you can't change it. So once it's set in stone, that's it. So if it's too chunky and too polygonal, once you've modeled it and you've applied all the modifiers and all that sort of stuff, and you want to go back and fix it, and you'll have to manually go back and fix it. Um, that's the case it, with this method that I'm doing here. So it's a, a bit more destructive than the usual method. So you can see here, I'm actually physically beveling things um, to smooth out or round out things. Once it's done, and if I go too far forward, I can't undo it. So um, yeah, keep that in mind as well, that you know, if you want a nice smooth edge to something, you're gonna actually have to put the poly in there for it to be smooth. So um, if you're going for something that's super low poly, then you don't have to worry so much about that. So again, it's really dependent on the situation in which you're planning on using the piece. The less polys, of course, means that um, you have more, potentially more issues when it comes to smoothing the normals. So um, if you wanna have a smooth edge around with the normals, when it comes to texturing, then you may have to add more polygons for being able to smooth things out more robustly. Um, if you don't care about that, then you don't care about that. That's it's, that's the way this video is going to go. It's really up to you if you're going to go down a certain route with your techniques. If you're designing for a game, for instance, you need to understand 
you know, the limitations of what your game can handle in order to model it properly. If you're adding way too many bevel uh, subdivisions on certain things, uh, that will affect the performance of your model in game. So you need to make sure that you're modeling intelligently um, for the scenario that you're building for. So you may have gotten into this uh, video so far, 10 minutes in and be wondering, where's all the techniques? What, why aren't you talking about any of these techniques? And the answer is, is that there's only really two techniques that I'm using here. <laughs> it's, uh, well, three maybe. It's uh, extruding a box, it's uh, beveling a box, and then using the Boolean tool. That's basically all I've used so far. So that's really all that there is to it. Um, mirror modifier for the engines and you know the ship itself to maintain symmetry uh i use the array modifier for those top boxes on the top to duplicate those and then the rest is just really just physically just modeling boxes and extruding boxes and uh, manipulating uh tubes and that's about it there's not really much to the method it's really just about having the sketch there as reference. And if you have the sketch there as reference, then it's way easier to know when and where to do those extrusions, when and where to do the booleans and when and where to do the bevels. Another thing to note that I really wanna talk about uh, in this video is that a lot of tutorials, I mean, obviously, because they're tutorials, they have to show the best case scenario, things working in tandem, step by step, according to a plan and just working as you know, you go through the tutorial. But in reality, that's not really the case. Anyone who's followed the tutorial and got a little bit frustrated that something's not working is, it's normal, all right? So um, you don't have to worry about <laughs> that happening here. I, you know, when things go wrong, I probably will be showing some of that as I model through things. Um, this video here though, that not many things went wrong um, with the, the modeling of this ship because I use such simple tools. Um, but you will find in the next video when I talk about the environment, uh, I might talk about things that I tried to approach a certain way that didn't work out, particularly with uh, geometry nodes and the plants and all that sort of thing, where um, you try something and you, know, you want to try something new and it just doesn't really work. Um, and then just fall back onto the or tried and true sort of methods. So for instance, geometry nodes versus instancing using hair par particles. Uh, in the case of the um, environment that I created for this video or the main video, hair particles worked better uh, just because it was easier, it ran faster. And um, when I applied the actual models, they worked better. Uh, that's basically it. Even though the geometry node stuff is more powerful, the old school method just worked better anyway. Um, anyway, enough of that. As you can see here, I'm to cut out the sides of the ship with some extra detail. I'm starting to add some tertiary, de no, secondary detail in this case. Um, again, just made some shapes, be uh, boolean them out, apply the boolean and done. Uh, again, I'm not too concerned about the quality of the geometry in this ship. Partly because it's, again, it's not gonna be used for a game. It's not gonna be used in a, a high resolution film. There's no displacements involved. So why bother? I'm also at the stage of creating secondary details for most of the ship. So little fins and adding the right sort of beveling around certain edges. Cause I want to have a little bit of shine on the edges there and make it feel a little bit softer. Even though it's meant to be uh, representative of a, you know, like a van basically. The idea of the idea, the idea behind this ship design was to have a sort of cargo ship van equivalent to just a regular moving van you would see out in the, um, the street in this in, in our world. Um, the only difference is that it is a spaceship. That's basically the plan here. What I wanted to get out of this design was something that was much more utilitarian, no style to it, something that wouldn't stand out when you would look at it in the street. It's something that would look, uh, you know, like something that isn't all that... Um, I wouldn't say dangerous, but like uh, inconspicuous would be the best way of putting it. A uh, inconspicuous looking ship that, you know, if it was carrying anything that was illegal, you could maybe guess, but otherwise it could just be a regular moving van, essentially. So um, that was the idea here. The other thing as well is that I didn't want to have it 
too chunky. Like I didn't want to have too many small details everywhere to sort of make it look too noisy. So that's another thing to be aware of is that when you're creating your secondary and tertiary details, especially with these sort of things, um, it's really tempting to just grab a kit bashing set and just put detail everywhere, everywhere. Um, you shouldn't really do that uh, because it, it makes the silhouette really noisy. It, uh, it You start to lose the purpose of the design. So you start to, um, you get so caught up in the idea of, oh yeah, I can add detail every fucking where, um, that <clears throat> you end up losing what is the essence of the design behind all that noise. So that's why I haven't gone down that route yet. I haven't resorted to that route yet of adding those things with the kit bashing set because um, I want to make sure that, you know, if I'm build, going to add those secondary details or those tertiary details around this ship, um, that I'm doing it purposefully, not without uh, a plan. Again, it's always good to have some sort of plan. It's a plan within a plan within a plan a lot of the time. So um, you don't end up just creating noisy shit. And then once you're happy with, you know, establishing your primary and then your tertiary, uh, your primary and your secondary design, then you can kind of move into the tertiary stuff, um, which I'm about to do in about uh, a few minutes here. Um, again, when you're designing these things as well, uh, you might want to think about practicality of the design. Like how would it work if you were to see it in the real world? Would it actually function as what you're trying to intend to build? So, you know, will the hinges work the same way that you'd expect them to in the real world? Or, um, if you're going to add landing gear, how would you design the landing gear for something that is meant to be really chunky and heavy? You're not going to have something too sleek. For instance, you're going to have something that has a lot of, you know, weight uh, support in the weights and stuff like that. Um, so you want to find balance in those regards as well. Another thing to note is that when you're designing vehicles or anything like that, is that uh, big chunky square things are way easier to model than sleek organic sort of things. Uh, when you're going down that sort of sleek route you'll probably end up having to rely more on subdivision style modeling where you have to smooth things out and make things look really good. Um, there are disadvantages in that method as well because uh, your poly counts will just blow out because everything has to be so smooth and subdivided and sleek and a lot more difficult to pull off uh, mainly because because you have to make sure everything's nice and smooth uh, and the reflections on those ob objects are going to be nice and smooth that um, maintaining that smoothness when you're doing extrusions or um, modeling around those things, uh, it can be really difficult. I'd say building organic looking vehicles, way, way, way more um, complicated, way more difficult than something like this, which is much more utilitarian. Um, all right, so I'm about to jump into adding the um, tertiary elements. Now, I didn't model any of these, I literally just purchased a bunch of packs, 10 bucks, really, 10 bucks for hours saved. It's a bargain, man. ArtStation, uh, Flip Normals has great libraries as well. 10 bucks, and you can download shit like these, like engine parts, um, hinges, landing gear, that sort of stuff. Trust me when I say this, 10 bucks saved is hours earned. Um, honestly, uh, if I had to do this manually, I would have had to spend way way more 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 time on this sort of thing um the start to end um production of this particular ship from the moment i opened up blender to the moment i closed substance painter was around three to five three to four hours all right now if i had to model all these engine parts and all these intricate detailed parts myself it would have gone for probably an extra day or two just to get these things done properly um, because you have to think about all these things. You have to think about the design. You have to think about the balance of all those different engine parts, the intricacies, this. Do you have to subdivide it? Do you have to bevel it all? It's painful, man, if you have to do this all yourself. Um, at least with these asset libraries, you can kind of mix and match and test things out. You can see I'm just dragging things in, seeing how they look, seeing whether I like it. Does it balance well with the ship design that I have? And if it doesn't, I just move on to another piece. It's so much easier. 
so much time saved. And if you're working for a client and they aren't all that too fussy about, you know, having everything absolutely bespoke, just save yourself the money. <laughs> you are saving money, honestly. You are saving money by downloading these things for 10, 15 bucks. Um, you're saving money because um, if you're working at a fixed rate, for instance, like say you're, you're getting paid a thousand bucks to make something like this and you spend a day modeling all these engine parts, you're actually losing money. You're losing money on you know, your project. Money, uh, it, because the hours that you could have spent, you spent modeling all these things individually, could have been spent on a different project where you'd be earning a new set of cash, a new fixed rate or a new hourly rate. Don't waste your time because you are also wasting money. Now, of course, this is a personal project that I'm working on. But at the same time, <laughs> you don't want to spend all that time doing things that you could have been using for other things. So, for instance, um, again, this was something that I built in an afternoon. Uh, I can't spend much more time than that other than the time I spent on this because I have now a little kid to worry about. Uh, I got to make sure I balance home life with this sort of stuff even between YouTube and stuff, YouTube and making this content for YouTube, for instance, uh, it's really tough to find the time to do that effectively. So I ain't gonna waste time on building all this intricate shit. And the other cool thing about having all these asset libraries ready to roll is that the sooner you get your ship done, the sooner you get to texture it. And I would say this, texturing stuff like this is way more fun than modeling it in some ways. Like you can do all kinds of fun stuff. And the other thing is that um, once you got the ship complete, a lot of the detail does come from the texturing. So don't feel so compelled that every single engine bit, every single vent needs to be physically modeled because you can probably get away with a lot of that in texturing, especially with Substance Painter, which allows you to, you know, just drag and drop alpha channel stuff on top of your ship. Like all the graffiti you see at the start of that, the video today, in the details you see there, that's all, again, asset packs that I downloaded from, I think, Flip Normals. Um, so kudos to them for having a, a decent marketplace for all these cool things. I didn't go through and actually create graffiti. I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. Um, so I downloaded the pack and then add it to Substance Painter and paint it that way. But it makes it way more fun to be able to get the shit done as soon as possible move on to texturing and let's see this thing come to life. And as you can see here, getting to this stage a lot quicker. Um, so I found just the right thing for, <laughs> for my uh, engines, just by coincidence. They almost fit perfectly without any real like skewing or anything like that. So the engines fit within my spaces. I can't believe it like that well. Um, and then I add other things like I replaced the door of my ship, my the door that I added myself. Uh, I was like, oh yeah, it's a door, it does its thing. But then I came across an actual, you know, door that was fully modeled. I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'm gonna use that. I'm not gonna bother making a new door. Um, and then I, uh, you know, I start to deviate a little bit from my sketch as I start to find cool things, like you know, um, adding secondary elements or tertiary elements uh, to the ship, like uh, gas tanks. I thought, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'll add some gas tanks to the side of the ship, and then. Um, you know, I'll add rails to the top of the engines and uh, add those sort of tertiary details because suddenly you start to think, oh yeah, maybe if this is a cargo ship, maybe it has the opportunity to add more cargo to the ship, sort of like when you add a bike rack to a car. Maybe I can add rails to the top of the ship uh, for it to carry extra cargo if it needs to. So it becomes more like a tug ship, uh, a more uh, multifaceted, utilitarian thing. So, you know, if it had to carry more stuff, you can strap it to the sides, you can strap it to the top, that sort of thing. Um, and of course, it's a trial and error situation where, you know, you, you bring something in, you test it out. If it doesn't work, then just don't use it. Um, if it doesn't balance well with the rest of the design, don't use it. But if it does, then you add it in and you include it as part of the design. All right, so one thing I actually didn't get around to recording in this session. Um, I don't even know why I recorded the ship to begin with, but I recorded it. Um, I didn't record the UV unwrapping part. 
Um, that being said, the unwrapping process I chose for this is pretty straightforward. I didn't even bother adding seams. I was like, fuck this, can't be bothered. The mesh is too complicated for me to go through and you know, physically look through everything. Um, I just used a uh, cube projection uh, for this. Or was it the, the automatic projection that like takes all four sides from Blender uh, camera views and then just cuts it. Um, and in order to get the right scale for all the different parts to make sure that I had enough detail in different parts of the ship, I just divvied them up in chunks of materials. So again, tertiary elements had their own material. Uh, certain engine parts had their own material. The main body had its own material. Like the, the primary shapes had their own material. The window had their own material. And that allowed me to sort of scale up the UVs so they won't, I don't have to worry about them overlapping, that sort of thing. Um, what you end up with is several material layers in Substance Painter, but um, you have to paint them individually instead of just one giant texture. There's no UDIMs in this case. I don't think there was. I don't think there was in this case. So no UDIM um, texturing in this one. Um, so every material has its own UV map uh, and it just made it a lot easier to just sort of break it up and make sure that I had enough scale, a pixel resolution for each part of the ship. Um, again, if you don't care about that, you can just project the whole ship into one UV map, but you will end up with tiny, tiny, tiny parts uh, of geometry, which um, only are about a, th a pixel thick. So be aware of that as well. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'm adding some rails to the ship. And again, really simple method, a tube, a few extrusions, and then I applied it to an array modifier and a curve modifier to allow me to sort of have it wrap around the, uh, the ship. And then I actually duplicated that curve and then added a bevel in the curve settings to add that sort of pipe-like effect. And that's it, really simple stuff. And then I just sort of modified the pipe a little bit and then made sure that it was all in one piece and yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. And then I just duplicated that again to um, get the um, the right sort of railing that I wanted. Again, really simple geometry, nothing fancy. Um, again, not everything that you do in 3D needs to be some extravagant, you know, thing to get nice looking models you don't have to be super super fancy about the way you go about it you don't have to worry about geometry nodes you don't have to worry about displacement maps you don't have to worry about all that sort of shit you can just work with the basic tool set and make magic happen it doesn't really matter um don't feel too overwhelmed when you start seeing people using like crazy node trees to you know generate buildings and stuff if you need to do that then you can go ahead and learn it but if you just need to make one fucking building, just don't even worry. Just build, just make the building. <laughs> All right, so the ship is almost done. I don't think I added any detail to the bottom of the ship because again, it's one of those things that, unless I'm getting real close in the camera, don't really need it. Don't really need to worry about it. And I, at this stage, I was starting to get pretty tired of the modeling process. So I was like, yeah, whatever. Let's just find some landing gear and just plonk it on the bottom. No one will know. It's fine. Um, again, like these, uh, the bottom of the ship, again, you can probably get away with just texturing in detail. I don't have to worry about adding any intricacies, any bumps and bruises or scratches or anything like that. So I'm not going to bother. Um, as we get into texturing, uh, it's always a good idea to make sure, again, that, um, you know, you've got everything applied so all your modifiers have been applied um all the symmetries have been applied and then you've unwrapped it properly it may take a few attempts for you to do that it always does with blender you you forget to apply a modifier or you forget to apply a uv map or something like that it usually takes a few goes before you bring it into substance and successfully get a good bake so don't be too conf too frustrated if that happens to you it happens to everyone all right so let's jump into the texturing part of this video and one of the first things you always want to do in Substance Painter when you are starting with a brand new model is to bake all those texture passes because basically Substance Painter lives off these texture passes that uh, get baked down. So stuff like or the procedural cracks, procedural dust, procedural uh, paint chips, they're all operating off of these texture passes as a base level side for masks, uh, for texture masks. 
Um, without it, it, you know, you have to do all that shit manually, which is just a pain in the ass. So part of the reason why we want to make sure that everything is unwrapped nicely is so we can bake things down um, to these texture passes. Now, the other thing to be aware of is that the quality of the bake is determined by the quality of your UV maps. Now, I know I just said that my UV maps were pretty shit. I did a pretty lazy job of it, but at a very minimal, I did go ahead and make sure that the rate, the average texel or pixel density of the UV maps were consistent across most of the ship. Um, there are some parts that, you know, will m retain a lot more detail than other parts. But overall, I wanted to make sure that at least if I'm going to texture the main body of the ship, that I can actually do so with a decent amount of detail. Now, in the latest version of Substance Painter, um, it can at least give you a preview of the texel density before you start the bake. Um, another thing that it does is um, it can actually show you where they're stretching and stuff like that as well. Um, Substance Painter does have an auto UV unwrapping tool set, but so far my experience with it hasn't been great. So it's always still a good idea to do it manually in Blender. I'm actually texturing this on a base level M1 MacBook Pro. That's why the baking takes forever on this laptop. That being said, um, I fucking love this laptop. It's great. Um, but it will take some time to go through the bakes, especially if you're going for a larger text, uh, pixel resolution for all the textures. So 4K, for instance, they're going to take a, a lot longer to bake down than a 2K pass. But it will retain a lot more detail in, say, the ambient occlusion, the, uh, the curvature, and the... Um, thickness passes. Now the nice thing about having all those now is that being able to automatically put in um, texture masks that utilize ambient occlusion and curvature and thickness is now open to you. So you can see here that I'm using the, uh, I'm, I have two layers of color. I have a dark green and a green color or teal. And then I'm using um, a texture mask uh, on the blue or the darker color, and then using a generator with a ambient occlusion or a curvature uh, modifier on that mask to be able to get that detail. So pretty cool stuff, much faster than doing it manually, much faster than uh, building up a bunch of node trees in Blender to do the same thing. Um, this is one of those things that, you know, this is where the Blender evangelists start to get in the way of themselves. They start to actually make their lives harder. They're so adamant about two things, whether to just never use Adobe products, which is ridiculous, or that everything has to be done in Blender because it can do everything, right? Just because something can do everything doesn't mean it does it better. And the thing about Substance Painter is that when it comes to texturing, it just wipes the floor on every other alternative, including Blender. Um, it works a lot more like Photoshop than it does having to worry about node trees, for instance. That's what designers for, after all. Um, you can get these cool effects like automatic dust generated in the certain crevices of the ship. And this is, again, this is just using a smart material. I'm just using a default set of smart materials here. Nothing, I haven't downloaded anything extra from here, although I will in the future. Stuff like that just makes life so much easier. Now, there are some shortcomings with Substance Painter that I won't go into here. Um, they're not major issues. Um, they're just small niggles that piss me off every now and then. But overall, you can't live without Substance Painter when it comes to working with 3D. You gotta get it. It is fast. It is reliable. It can output to multiple versions of uh, different kinds of materials. It can even export out a um, an AR-ready model for you with the textures attached to it. Again, you don't have to worry about re-importing it to Blender if you can just export it straight from Substance. It's just awesome. Now, Substance Painter is largely a sort of layer stack based tool set. It basically works just like Photoshop in how it operates where uh, a layer on top can affect the layer above, below. Um, you can add modifiers, you can add filters, you can do all sorts sort of stuff. And then all the materials you can just use straight from the Substance um, default set that you get when you download it for the first time or you can purchase inverted commas um, 
materials from the substance library. Now the substance library is it's not really purchasing. It's just you get a bunch of points every month that you own substance as a subscription and it resets those points every month. And eventually you build up a ridiculous amount of excess points. Very simple. Um, uh, there's never been a time ever since I bought substance uh, as a subscription in 2017, I've never, ever, ever run out of points. It's basically a point per material. So you get like a hundred points every month. So the likelihood of you going through them all is pretty, pretty rare unless you're like a professional material artist or something like that. The other nice thing about Substance Painter is that it allows you to be a lot more experimental with your textures. Um, you can see here that I'm trying to, maybe I tried to, a different kind of metal, for instance. I can see if the little puckers on the on the ship could look any, uh, any good. And then, uh, you know, if you don't like it, just get rid of it. Doing something like that in Blender requires you to actually set up multiple nodes. Nodes and mix nodes and all sorts of stuff and having to find the right... Um, textures to emulate that and yeah fuck that shit um way way easier if you just just get substance honestly and if you're wondering about whether or not you can you know live with some alternatives like quicksaw painter or whatever the hell it is uh yeah you can you can but like it is a lot more frustrating to use um mainly down to the auto baking reasons um i don't know if it has it yet but Quicksaw doesn't have auto baking. You've got to actually bake it in Blender, take the baked textures from Blender, put it into Quicksaw, and then it will work. And that is painful because Blender's baking system is dog shit unless you pay for a plugin, you know? So you still got to pay to get better quality stuff, even in Blender. So um, why, why try and find the cheapest alternative if, this sort of semi-affordable, relatively speaking, if you're professional, it's affordable. If you're a student, maybe not, but you know, you're still gonna save yourself a lot of pain. Make the investment. Trust me, it's worth it. If you can afford it, do it. If your wage allows you to have a little bit of disposable income to allow you to pay for a subscription for a month to try it out, I definitely recommend you do that. This is one of those things, right? Like. I fucking hate using Maya. The reason being is that for the money you're paying, it doesn't feel like you're getting your money's worth, especially if you're an independent artist. If you're an independent artist and you're using Maya, I feel like you're wasting your money. Because if you're not working in a pipeline, you don't need those advanced tools that Maya relies on to work with large sets of people. Whereas with Blender, you get pretty much the same thing but you don't get those integrated pipeline tools that if you're an independent artist, you don't fucking need. Um, it doesn't save you time and it doesn't save you money. Whereas in this instance with Substance Painter, it does all that for an independent artist. It saves you time and ultimately it will save you money because you don't have to spend so much time rebuilding custom shaders for everything you do. It's all there in the library. You can download other people's materials for, well, sometimes for free, sometimes from Gumroad, whatever you need. And the actual library that comes from the source uh, webpage for Substance has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, interesting materials to work with anyway. So you have this really robust library to work from. So you save time, you save money, you get a superior, product and it is constantly improving along the way as well why would you not want to invest in that that's that's the the logic I'm, I'm coming from here and for those who are watching this 40 minutes into the video uh congratulations if you are if you are particularly interested in texturing in substance painter and you want to see some actual content from me specifically around that let me know in the comments. I would love to do it myself. Um, I have a few ideas in the pipeline. So if you want to see it, let me know and I'll do it. Um, because it's something I haven't really touched on much in the past. So what I'm doing at the moment with the ship is just trying to get some dirt on the base of the ship and to have it transition sort of in a sort of rust, rusty, dirty kind of way from top to bottom. It took a bit of trial and error for me to figure it out, but basically it was about mixing 
two different filtered masks in the right kind of way. So you can do that in Substance Painter. You can actually mix masks just through a few modifiers, which is really cool. So I ended up using uh, a gradient mask and a, I think it was just a dirt automatic smart mask. Um, and then I combined them in a, in a way that allowed me to get that right um, gradient. But it just goes to show you just how robust this software is as well. Like the amount of ways you can mix the defaults is pretty insane. You don't actually have to download that many extra materials to get really cool looking stuff. Um, for instance, I think for some of this ship, I just used the default chip paint um, smart material. It was enough for this thing. And of course, the other nice thing about this is that if you want to change the color of a material that is a preset, you can just do that pretty quickly. Um, there's no real need to dive into the nitty gritty of any particular material to really change anything. Um, and the really robust materials have preset um, things like, uh, you know, the amount of rust you add to it or the amount of scratches or the amount of bumps and bruises that you add to a particular material. That's all in the preset. So people actually build this into the materials for you to download, which is really cool. So a lot of what you will see from here on in is pretty much me repeating myself with different kinds of passes of materials. So I'll add a mask, I'll paint in some detail, I'll add a new material, I'll add a mask, paint in some detail. I try to make sure that when I'm working in Substance Painter, for the most part that whatever I make is relatively uh, procedural in that it's non-destructive. Um, you can paint destructively in Substance Painter, but if you don't utilize the power of the masks, I feel like you're working with your one hand behind your back because um, if you want to make changes, it makes it so much easier to work with the mask system in, in, in um, Substance Painter. Um, it's incredibly powerful. And one of the other cool things that I discovered as I was painting this ship is that the Kyle brushes, the Kyle T. Webster brushes that I mentioned in the main video on my main channel for this, they actually work in Substance Painter. So if you want to have that sort of textured painterly look, that sort of, I hate to say it, the arcane look, if you want to call it anything, those brushes <laughs> can make such a difference. They're so cool to be using, be used in this thing. I'll probably do that a lot more often in the future as well. I thought that was really neat. Uh, one of the other things that I want to talk about when it comes to texturing in Substance Painter is there is some shortcomings and it's mostly down to a, I guess you can say a mental shortcoming when working with Substance Painter. It's a similar thing to the kit bashing issue where you have all this opportunity to add ridiculous detail, scratches, bumps, um, patterns, paintings, uh, you can add um, buttons and lights and um, all those sort of things everywhere, wherever you want on the ship. So it becomes really tempting to add detail everywhere, add detail in every single spot, every single corner has something going on. That is something you have to train yourself to avoid doing. You still need to find balance in the textures that you're creating. Um, you need to find parts where there's going to be primary detail, there's going to be secondary detail, and then tertiary detail. So what I mean by that is that if you're designing a ship like this, in my case, my primary detail is the color of the ship, which is this sort of teal aqua color. Leave it at that, add a little bit of dirt. That's pretty much it. I'm not gonna add any like crazy uh, bumps or um, extra details above that paint because I, I, I have to go back to the original concept of what this thing is, which is basically a glorified delivery truck, all right? Gl delivery trucks at their worst basically just have a bunch of graffiti on it. But the actual you know, vanilla fresh off the, off the um, factory floor truck is basically gonna be a white box in reality. Okay, so I'm not gonna add any crazy details like that because that's not what the purpose of this machine is. The secondary details come into play after that. So um, you'll see me add some basic orange stripes along the ship. Um, that's kind of like a, 
it's like a hint of like what this truck used to be, which was probably like a company delivery truck. And that's where the branding was. And this was a resold truck given to some people or stolen by someone and then repurposed for their own use. And then it becomes this sort of graffiti covered piece of shit. All right. You need to think about that in stages in the same way you think about how you modeled your truck. The other thing to be aware of is basically the balance of color. All right. So your primary color, your secondary color and tertiary color. It's very similar to uh, how you would go about designing a logo or designing a website. You want to keep your color palette relatively muted. Um, keep it within three, maybe four colors for your primary set of colors. And then on top of that, you can add little sparks of different color here and there. So for instance, in my case, it's the, um, the green on the ship, the orange on the stripes and the red on the fuel tanks. They're the, they're the main colors that I've got for my, my ship. Um, after that, I've got small splashes of random color around the ship with graffiti to help it stand out. Not only does this make this thing feel better designed, it helps the viewer understand what's going on with the ship. Um, it keeps their eyes from darting around everything and it helps the ship situate itself better in an environment with you have different colors. So if you have a specific color palette for your, um, your vehicle or even a character or a building and you have to situate it in, a, in an environment, by giving it a distinctive sort of motif, it helps to stand out amongst the environment that it sits in. Just be mindful that when you are doing this, that um, if you are blending these colors, they have to sit together as well. They have to sit together in context with uh, what you've already painted. So I can't have a brand new orange stripe, for instance, on top of this dirty ship, all right? The dirt has to sit on top of the orange stripe to blend in properly to make it feel like it's used and old. Otherwise, it starts to look very digital very quickly because this, the orange stripe is really pristine and clean and then everything else around it is dirty as shit. You want to make sure that you layer your colors in the appropriate fat. Once you've done those primary and secondary colors, you can start to worry about the tertiary stuff. So like um, larger splotches, larger details of scratches and grime and stuff like that. You can start to add that on top. So for instance, you'll see in a moment, once I've established these two orange stripes, I'm happy with the overall look of the basic ship that I start to add a little bit more sort of handcrafted texturing to the thing. And that's where those Kyle brushes came into handy, I think. I don't know if I use them in this one. It might just be a, a splotchy brush. But um, I start to add like oil leaks around parts that connect to the ship. I start to add a little bit of grime that isn't realistic, but adds to the flavor of where the ship is going to be used in context with my animation. I try to make it feel like it's part of that environment, that style. Um, and it becomes, it's really fun to use as well, using these textured brushes. The only thing that's actually a pain in the ass is uh, just trying to find the right brushes. So sometimes it actually might be worth trying to download some new ones if you think there's a palette that works for you. So if there's a style of brush stroke that you like and they don't, they're not part of the Kyle brush set or they're not part of the Photoshop brush set, you can just download new ones or make your own ones. Here I'm trying to use the adaptive brushes in um, Substance Painter, but I didn't like the result. It just kind of looked shit. So uh, back to ma pa manually painting. That's the other thing as well. You're so tempted to make sure that everything's procedural that you forget that you need to actually paint like a real artist for once. So um, yeah, that's also really important is that don't be afraid to actually be an artist for once. So the way I'm doing the, um, the grime is that I'm using a primary color just so I can see how it looks and then just changing the color after the fact. Much easier to do because you can see how the details work and then um, work in the, the right color afterwards. 
So you can see here I'm just adding grime here and there, adding scratches, adding bruises, that sort of thing. Um, it's really fun actually. And then I'm adding like bits of like just, you know, like when you have a dirty window or you um, you wiped off some graf like when you see someone's wiped off graffiti, for instance, off a wall and there's still these weird smears everywhere. That's what I'm trying to add to the ship as well at this point. Um, every now and then I turn off the, um, the rendered preview and just work with flat mode so I can see how it's operating. And it's also a good indication is of uh, how the ship would look in a tune shaded environment. So um, removing all the fancy uh, metals and stuff like that, how does the ship look as just a painted piece of 3D um, model? Once I'm happy with that overall uh, texturing of the body of the ship, I decide to just move on to the secondary parts. And the secondary parts, in my opinion, are probably a lot easier than the um, the main body because it's not the feature part, it's not the feature set of the, um, the thing, it's not the thing that people will look at the most. So I basically just use procedural pre-made materials for like the, the gas tanks and the um, uh, the little bits and bobs, the greebles as you call them, um, because it's just easier, it's faster, and it, it doesn't require all that much you know, intricacy in my opinion. So you can see as well that you can see that um, a lot of the uh, texels have different sizes. So the gas tanks have a larger texels than um, the little bits at the bottom. Um, that just as goes to show you how unbalanced my UV maps were. Like the door there has a ridiculous amount of resolution. Um, that's just my choice. You, you know, I'm not putting this in a game engine. I'm not um, using it in anything other than my piece. So for me, it's fine. And that's one of the biggest things that I had to always fight against in my mind mentally uh, when I was working on my own projects early on is that uh, I watch all these videos, I you know, I learned about texturing, I learned about modeling and all that sort of stuff and I always were taught you got to do it a certain way, you got to be optimized, you got to be clean every step of the way, everything has to be perfect, otherwise your thing is going to be trash. Now that is so not the case when you're working on your own projects, you don't have to be so pristine and perfect if you're working on a personal project if it works if it runs okay then it's fine don't worry about it if the ship looks good when it's rendered in shot then it's perfect for the needs of your film okay think about that if you just don't care if there's any scale issues when you see it in camera then that's fine too because if you don't care, most likely someone out, most people won't care either. You may see a few comments in a video, maybe saying, oh, why does that look a bit weird? Um, but again, you can just justify saying, yeah, yeah, I saw it. I just didn't give a shit. It's fine for my needs. Um, so if you're beating yourself up, trying to be absolutely perfect with everything you do, especially with a personal project like this, don't be. Just worry about being better in the next time you try using this stuff. So yeah, as I go through, you know, texturing these gas tanks, I start texturing all the greebles. I start giving them their own sort of color motif. So gas tanks, I, I was actually thinking about having multicolored gas tanks as if they say they went to different gas stations and picked up different route supplies. But then I just couldn't be fucked. But it also uh, worked out in the long run not doing that because it helped to settle the design without being too noisy in terms of color. The other thing I've decided as well is that any greeble type piece, so the side paneling, the hooks, the um, the rails at top, they're all going to be one color as well, which is going to be a grayish metal, gunmetal color. That helps to settle the design as well because now it all looks like it's part of the intention behind how the ship is designed. If they were all different colors, you'd be going, why? Why are they all different colors? Uh, why is that part blue when this part's red? It, it doesn't make sense. By helping to settle your color palette, you help to settle the design and make it feel more tangible and more real. And that is also the case when it comes to stylized texturing like I'm doing here. This is technically stylized texturing. I'm, I'm not doing anything particularly super realistic. It's sort of like a semi-realistic approach to um, these vehicles. Um, you need to make sure that your work feels settled even in a stylized approach. 
even if you're going off the rails crazy, you still need to make it feel like if someone's watching this, they can actually lose themselves in the reality of that story that you're creating. If everything is different for the sake of being different, then it starts going away from being something that people can either lose themselves in or believe in, and it almost becomes more like a pastiche that they start to analyze. Ah, oh, what's that thing? What's this thing? Uh, that's how they made this. You start to see the elements as what they are rather than being part of a collective whole in terms of story. Okay, so one of my favorite things in Substance Painter that I haven't seen in other software is the ability to bucket fill quads or bucket fill UV islands. It is one of the most useful time-saving things I think I've seen in any software. It is so fucking good. The one thing I wish it did have though was the ability to bucket fill edge loops. That would be so cool if we could do that. I would love to see that in the future. But as it stands, you can do um, triangles, uh, squares, and you can do whole UV islands. So if you want to bucket fill a UV island, you can do the whole thing, which is really cool. So that means these pipes, for instance, like these gas pipes, click, 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 they're all red. And then everything around, like that's holding the pipes into place, click, 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 they're all black, easy, done. Now, um, as I get into it, I can, you can also add emission um, colors. So for instance, I'm adding the, um, the light of the engines coming through the back and the sides of the ship. Um, and then eventually I get to the decals. Unfortunately, I didn't actually record the entire decal process because I just forgot to. <laughs> um, but basically what I did is I downloaded a bunch of alpha channel texture pa uh, packs um, from Flip Normals, brought them into Substance Painter. I did do some modifications inside of Photoshop first. I put them into a square canvas and then put the graffiti to be used as a brush um, and then brought them back into Substance. Um, and then just sort of plate pasted on the different decals individually. Um, super time saving, awesome as well if you can download those. Again, five bucks for graffiti. Again, it's so much easier to do it uh, that way than having to build it yourself. Okay, so we're getting to the tail end of this video here. And um, basically I'm gonna end it with the substance stuff here. Um, bringing those materials back into Blender is basically a cinch. You get, you can actually set up Substance Painter to, to export out your textures in the style of Blender materials. So roughness, diffuse, uh, metal, normals, etc. Um, set it up with the Blender preset, bring those textures into Blender and you're golden. It's really simple. It, it takes nothing. All right, so the last thing I would add in the process of texturing these sort of vehicles is the the tiny details, the tiny details like stickers, decals, graffiti. Uh, if I were to add like textured uh, vents and stuff, this is when I would add it as well. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process. There's different ways you can do it in, in, in um, Substance Painter. One way is to just have a material, add a mask and then paint in using a alpha channeled or a, yeah, apple channeled brush um, shape or stencil. And you basically stencil them in using the stencil like that, like as you can see there. Um, this is determined by the resolution of your textures, how much detail you get from those masks. It's really down to you. Um, and then there's the other alternative, which is to bring in colored decals as, um, as materials as well. So didn't have time to record those parts, unfortunately, but um, I'm hoping in the future that I'll probably make another video on this on this topic anyway. Um, as we wrap up this video, I just wanna say uh, thank you for watching. Um, it's been awesome to go through my thoughts as I was working through this piece. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know in the comments. Um, hopefully you got through the whole video and you found something useful in it. Uh, again, if you want to download the source files from this video, feel free to sign up with Patreon. It's $3 or $5. You get the exact same thing either way. Uh, Discord privileges, working files, ad-free videos. Um, Discord uh, competition is on its way as well. Um, so you get to be a part of that if you want to. Uh, but apart from that, I'm going to let you go. Thank you for watching. 
enjoy the process and I'll catch you later. Sears, bye.